Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for Signs and Markings, Innovations That Work. My name is Vishal Kakkar. I'm Traffic Engineering Division Manager with Manatee County, Florida, and I'm the moderator for today's session. Before we get started, I would like to go over some housekeeping items. ITE would like to thank champion sponsors, Gannett Fleming, Siemens, and Transoft Solutions for their support of the conference and Kim Lee Hon for sponsoring this week's sessions. In today's session, we will have speaker presentations first, followed by Q&A and discussion. We encourage, encourage you to type your questions into the question pod as they come to mind throughout the session. And we will address as many questions as uh, time will allow following all the presentations. If the session ends before all questions are answered, some of our speakers may be able to answer additional questions in the wonder room after the session to access wonder go to the conference platform where you selected this session and select hallway talk then go to the technical sessions area at the end of the session we will confirm which speakers can spend a few additional minutes in the wonder room after the session your attendance your attendance in this session includes pdh credits the link for receiving PDH credits is shared in the chat box. So be sure to save the link to access the post session evaluations. The recording of this session will be available in ITE Learning Hub within 48 hours for all meeting registrants. I would like to introduce our speakers. For today's session, we have Brian Chandler, National Director for Traf Transportation Safety, DKS Associates in Seattle, Washington. Kay Fitzpatrick, Senior Research Engineer and Program Manager with Texas A&M Transportation Institute in Texas. Corey Edgar, Managing Director, PBX Engineering Limited uh, from Victoria, British Columbia. And Michael Fontaine, Associate Director with Virginia Department of Transportation from Charlottesville, Virginia. Detailed speaker bios are listed on the website under the session description. Now let's hear from our first speaker, Brian Chandler. Hi everyone, this is Brian Chandler and I'm looking forward to talking to you today about practical transportation solutions to save lives. Um, as you can see on the screen there, I'm the National Director of Transportation Safety for DKS and we're gonna jump right in. We're gonna really start by uh, thinking about this, this concept of um, systemic safety and systemic safety analysis. You may have heard it called safe systems. Many years ago, we called it systematic safety, but the, the general concept remains that whenever we take a look at our overall traffic crashes, especially serious crashes, one thing that we found over the years is that the fatal crash locations tend to be random. You can see the image of the whack-a-mole game over there on the right that you might have played at a, a Chuck E. Cheese or a carnival. And what we had been doing historically is looking at those black spots, people where pe locations where people had been hurt or killed, and going to those spots and trying to fix them. And what we found is that year to year, because those maybe weren't the best places to invest our safety funds, that those locations just tended to move around, yet the overall number of crashes, um, especially fatal and severe injury crashes, didn't go down. And so over the last 15 or 20 years, we've really started to look at a, a look at crash types above location and really thinking through those. And the reason for that is because that they're more predictable. You can see by the kind of little check marks on the calendar there that month to month, year to year, the manner in which the attributes related to traffic crashes, especially serious injury and fatal crashes, tend to be very similar from year to year. So if we can shift our focus, or as we have shifted our focus from locations to crash types, we found that we've been able to have a lot more success. And so what I'm going to do today is just very briefly introduce um, some ways to, to focus in on some very uh, low cost ways to look at um, ways to systemically uh, improve safety on your roads. So we're going to start by how we identify safety needs. This is something else that has, has changed over the last few years. 
Um, we talked, or I talked just 30 seconds ago about crash history and how we're not looking so much at locations. Um, but even though that's not the entire focus, we do safety projects at real life locations. And so having a history of where those crashes occur, especially if we go down to minor injury and property damage crashes, that can give us a database of crashes, just give us more math to work with, right? We've got more data points. The graphic in the top left here is a Tableau map that we've developed at DKS for a number of different jurisdictions to give just a very quick, easy look at uh, the locations of crashes, crashes by attribute. We may look at just roadway departure or only intersection crashes. And so this gives us a way to do what we call it really like a sketch tool or a back of the napkin look at um, collisions that have occurred. Um, this tab is a pin map. We have another tab that is a heat map and that just gives us a starting point of where to look. Um, the graphic or the photo below that you can see is just a, a roadway here. This is a horizontal curve that indicates that there's a lot of other information that we like to look at besides just the crash data. Safety data and crash data are not synonymous terms. Then when we're thinking about safety risk, we also want to look at things like a roadway condition. Like this is a great situation or a great example here. You've got a road here that's going into a curve, relatively narrowish lanes, although the pavement condition looks pretty good. There's a center line stripe, but no edge line striping and no signing. And we can maybe presume no warning signs, although I'm not exactly sure about this site. So if we think about this could be potentially a risky location based only on the road conditions, not knowing traffic volume, not knowing the crash history. And that leads to thinking also about traffic data. What about traffic volume or the makeup? Who are the road users here? Are there bicyclists, pedestrians, large trucks using this facility, motorcyclists? And what might some of their unique needs be at this location. And thinking about when we do a low cost safety treatment, can we affect more people if we put that treatment at locations that have um, a higher traffic volume? So just thinking kind of turns the crash rate discussion on his head a little bit, but it's just worth another kind of a different look at how we're analyzing crashes. And then on the right is just, a, this is a video analytics example at a signalized intersection where we're now able to take a look not only at crash history, but we can look at locations and start to be more predictive and proactive and identify conflicts and quote unquote near misses or close calls. We can see some user behaviors like red light running and um, maybe vehicles encroaching on the crosswalk in a way that we couldn't before using the new technology tools that we have available. And so putting all those together allows us to do a better job identifying needs. And then once we identify those needs, is looking at uh, some of these low cost lifesavers. So the toolbox of those, we're just gonna look at really three quick examples today. Obviously there's a lot more um, beyond this, but just a, a quick start. I wanna talk about roadway departure. Um, and there's really three different things we do whenever we're trying to address roadway departure crashes, which is essentially a vehicle running off the road, or crossing their lane and getting in a head-on crash. And the first one is to keep the vehicle on the roadway. Second is to provide a safe recovery if they depart the road. And the third is to reduce the severity of a crash if a crash occurs. So when we talk about the lowest cost and frankly the most effective, these solutions are lower cost on the left side of the screen and they're more effective on the left side of the screen. The further we go to the right, the more expensive the treatments tend to be and the less effective they tend to be in reducing crashes or their severity. As you can imagine, just even theoretically, if we keep vehicles on the roadway, then there's no, they're not going to depart the road if they stay in their lane. So that's what we like to start with and try to do first. And so a number of solutions we can do here, and you're gonna hear this mantra a lot in the next 10 minutes is signing and striping. There's a lot we can do with signs, a lot we can do with pavement marking that can really make a difference. You can see this first image on the left. There are just a series of different things, really a, kind of a laundry list or a package of things that you could do. You probably wouldn't put every one of these treatments at any single curve, but these are a number of things that you can do, including oversizing any of these signs, doubling up the signs, using fluorescent yellow sheeting. You can see the image in the top right corner there are adding reflective posts to Chevron signs. Those could be added to advanced warning signs as well. And then the bottom right is another interesting solution here is using flexible delineators instead of chevrons in situations where a full sign may just not be feasible 
or may um, not be possible if you're trying to do a lot of curves or if you have them in kind of some weird locations of thinking about delineators as a treatment as well. Um, next, looking at unsignalized intersections, uh, this is a situation where oftentimes the main line here or the non-stop control could be very high speed. So anything that we can do to help both the main line driver be aware of traffic on the side street and the side street driver be aware of vehicles that may be coming or that they need to be paying attention there and to be sure they stop at the stop sign. So you can see uh, just a series of things here. Again, focus predominantly on signing, striping, maybe a little bit of curbing there. You can see with that mountable curb in the middle. With really the biggest, the big idea there with that mountable curb is to give you some place to double up your stop sign. And then again, in this situation, you could also choose to uh, dub or to oversize your warning signs or for the, for the warning signs, use a uh, fluorescent yellow for those as well. The other thing to note here is you don't have to have sight distance problems to add warning signs at intersections. This is something I frankly have changed my mind about over the last couple of decades. Um, I used to do sight distance analysis before I would even consider putting up either an intersection warning sign, like you can see there on the, the main line, or a stop ahead sign. But to me, if you've got locations where you're seeing a history of crashes at all at these intersections, um, warning signs are a really good, inexpensive starting point to try to address that need. And then signalized intersections. Um, we've got a whole package of things. The first image in the top left there are adding things like one head per lane, um, lane control usage signs. Um, that may be a little bit beyond what we would call really low cost um, in today's conversation, but it's that next level where you're still um, finding ways that you can improve safety at a signal. The <laughs> bottom left there is a protected left only. Um, really the two ways that people get hurt and killed at signals are left turns in front of other people in a permissive left turn and angle crashes that are usually due to red light running. If it's a vehicle, it's a vehicle crash. The next image there in the middle is again, warning signs <laughs> that kind of continuing the theme here of, of signing striping. You also can make some connections between the warning sign and the signal itself with a little bit of technology and some flashers. You can tie the traffic signal timing into a flasher so it only goes off when that signal is yellow or green, or sorry, yellow or red for the approaching driver. And then on the right is just basic clearance intervals and thinking about your traffic signal uh, timing. There's so much we can do with the controllers that we don't fully utilize so much of the time and work that can be done there. Also wanna be sure to take a, a special look at um, pedestrians and bicyclists. This is anyone who's walking, biking, or rolling on our system. An image that you've probably seen several times now is that when a pedestrian is hit at different speeds, their possibility of surviving that crash goes way down as the speeds go up. And so some things that we take a look at as we're thinking about pedestrian and bicycle safety are speed limits first. You know, there's a number of cities that are looking at um, target speeds and then setting speed limits accordingly. There's a recent report that has just come out. I think you're gonna uh, hear or have heard from Kay Fitzpatrick in this session on another topic, but she also was principal investigator on this NCHRP report on setting speed limits using a, a new procedure and tool with some new information that, that their team has developed. I've already used a draft version of this report last year for two different agencies and had a lot of success with that. And I think there's a lot of interesting work happening now in speed and that's very much connected to ped and bike safety. A couple other things that we can do at intersections. One is for turning vehicles, this is a pedestrian lead intervals at traffic signals. The idea here is actually fairly simple. You give the pedestrians three to seven seconds head start with the walk signal before the adjacent green um, gets their signal. Because one thing that we see at intersections is turning vehicles and pedestrians can really be problematic and can cause some conflicts. So getting the pedestrians out in the cone of vision of those vehicles before they make their turning movement helps them be seen so they're not in the blind spot of those vehicles that are making those turns. And another more recent treatment over the last few years has been a, um, called a couple of different things, a hardened center line, a left turn traffic calming, I've heard it said, with, which is really a similar concept of one, getting the pedestrians in the cone of vision by having those left turn vehicles needing to make a more kind of angular um, 
turn. And the other thing you can probably infer from that, if you see it, is that that left turning vehicle is going to have to take that a lot slower, right? Because their radius of turning is significantly uh, tighter than it was in the left scenario there. So that's an important piece there to keep in mind. And then the third part of this is you've identified the stuff, you've, you've um, come up with some low cost treatments, and it's really important that we take care of the things we have. And so a, a little game to play right now is find the sign. I made this field visit just about three weeks ago and noticed that there was a, a warning sign totally covered up. And really an important part of this, we do not want our drivers or any road users having to play Where's Waldo to find the signs, especially warning and regulatory signs, which we very much need them to pay attention to. Um, maintenance is a big deal. Uh, maintaining these signs, that first image there on the left, that, that it's a stop sign in case you can't tell. I saw that on the same field visit three weeks ago that I took the other picture. So there's some, some maintenance issues going on here. It could be anything from vegetation clearing, being sure you're checking on retroreflectivity. You could have knockdowns and missing signs. Again, I'm gonna mention the signal timing as a, a maintenance issue, maintenance and operations. And wanted to make a one quick call out, this image in the bottom right, um, I just saw this a few days ago. This is from a um, city in Kansas that it has a, just very easy, low cost. One person can go in and replace a knockdown stop sign. You can see there's a series of just, it's really kind of ingenious, just makes it really easy to do that without needing any tools or very few tools. Um, there's some, some details about that on the Federal Highway website. They identified that just as a, a, a quick look there. So maintenance, super important. So just to wrap up, really three things here is uh, identifying your safety needs, thinking more about the types of crashes um, than the location of a particularly severe crashes, and then focusing in on um, those types, and then using tools beyond just crash history to identify your needs. Adding these low cost lifesavers that I just walked through and showed. And then also being sure that you maintain what you have. It's really important that the investment that you've made in these, whether it's low cost or high cost safety treatments, that it's really important that those are maintained. And with that, thank you very much. It was good to be with you and looking forward to Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. That was um, wonderful. Thank you for making the points, specifically me being from a local agency. Uh, maintenance could not be stressed enough. I know how our maintenance folks, they work very, very hard um, to get us out of a liability situation, but also to make sure that all road users are safe. Imagine a knockdown stop sign uh, can cause a very severe angle crash um, and or worse, a fatality. Uh, uh, again, reminder, if you have any questions for Brian, please include them in the question pod um, because we will be taking all the questions at the end after all the speakers uh, have uh, presented. Our, our next speaker, is Kay Fitzpatrick. Kay. Well, howdy. Today I'm going to talk about a textile study that looked at the effectiveness of pedestrian crossing treatments at night. Uh, I am Kay Fitzpatrick and I'm with the Texas A&M Transportation Institute. Texas, like every state, is seeing a, con a concerning trend where there are more pedestrian fatalities and the percentage of pedestrian fatalities of all motor vehicle crashes is going up. A large majority of those crashes are occurring during the nighttime. So TxDOT decided to take a look at the pedestrian treatments effectiveness during this critical period. The goal of this study was to compare daytime and nighttime operations at three pedestrian treatments. Uh, the first one that I'm going to talk about is in the top right corner, and that's the pedestrian hybrid beacon. Um, it shows a red indication uh, during the pedestrian walk signal. The second one I'm going to talk about is the Rectangular Rapid Flashing Beacon, or RFB, and an image of that is in the bottom left corner. 
it shows a yellow indication that has a, a rapid flashing for, for the rectangular beacons, hence its name. The third type of treatment that I'm going to talk about is in the bottom right corner, and that's where the LEDs are embedded in the border of the sign. Um, we've nicknamed this LEDM for our embedded. The study approach was to identify 30 sites, uh, 10 sites for each of the different treatments, and to collect data during both the daytime and the nighttime. The sites um, identification process varied depending upon the type of treatment. Um, in Texas, uh, the city of Austin have installed a number of pedestrian hybrid beacons. And so we obtained a list from the city where all their PHBs were that we could use to help us in site identification. TxDOT sponsored a study in the uh, previous year on the LEDs embedded. And so we updated that list to look for sites that would be candidates for this study. The rectangular rapid flashing beacons are being installed um, throughout Texas. And so we used our network within TechSite to help us identify potential study sites for the RFB. As I said, our goal was to identify 10 sites for each treatment. And with the PHBs, we hit that goal on, on the nose. With the RFB, due to some data collection efficiencies, we actually were able to collect data at um, one or two more. The LEDs embedded were more of a challenge. Um, we, we wanted 10 sites, but we started to have a challenges with finding sites. Um, and um, the LEDs seemed to, we had some, some challenges with some equipment. So we, we had six sites for the nighttime data. Um, by pulling in the data from the previous years, we had 13 sites for the daytime data. When we were selecting sites, we used the posted speed limit and the median type as um, to help us decide which sites because we wanted a range. We wanted some low speed and some high speed sites. We also decided to, to only have two and four lane roads. So we eliminated the, the six lane roads, um, which was an op, uh, more of an option for the PHBs. We used a protocol called staged pedestrians for, for the measure of effectiveness at our sites. The stage pedestrian is a TTI employee who has been trained to approach the crossing in the same manner for every site. We want the pedestrian behavior to be consistent so that when we're looking at the differences between the PHB and the RFB or the LED embedded, we have more confidence that it's the, the treatment itself rather than the behavior of the pedestrian. The uh, goal was to have 60 stage pedestrian crossings, so that's 30 one way and 30 the other, or four hours. And um, we, um, we collected the data between November 2019 and February 2020 for the nighttime. Um, because we pulled in some data from the previous year, we also had some May 2019 data. So here are the answers per site. Uh, driver yielding is, you can think of it as the percent or the decimal equivalent of drivers who yielded that should have yielded. So we want 1.0 or 100% of our drivers yielding that should have yielded. And what you can see in this graph is the red closed circles are nighttime, the red open circles are the daytime. And for the PHBs, it's very, very high, uh, above 95% in all cases. Um, the next thing that, that really pops out for me are the, the blue diamonds. Again, the open diamond is daytime, the closed diamond is nighttime. And, and what pops out is, 
the big range of driver yielding values at these types of pedestrian crossings. Um, we go from 5% all the way to about 82%. The uh, RRFBs are, are kind of that middle band of findings where it's it has driver yieldings of between 60 and, and 95%. So this graph shows the individual sites. The next graph shows the statistical findings when we consider all of our driver yielding data for all of our sites, for all of our treatments. And the graph here is, is an average, um, um, a statistical prediction of what it would be for the, the various treatments during daytime and nighttime. The question we wanted to answer was, are these devices more or less effective at night? So what you can see with that red bar at top is that the, the driver yielding is, is similar day and night for the PHB. Um, for the RFB, we found a slightly higher driver yielding at night, but it was not statistically significant. For the LED embedded, we found a statistically significant higher driver yielding during the daytime. So to answer that question, the answer is it depends. It depends on what the treatment type is, whether it's more or less effective during the daytime or the nighttime. A lot of folks want to know, are these devices more or less effective based upon the operating speed? We use the posted speed limit as a surrogate for the operating speed. And when you consider all of the data, what we found is that the performance of the PHB and the RFB for this set of studied sites was similar for that low speed and the high speed. What the two key um, test shows us is that, and, and that's a statistical analysis approach, is that there was a difference in the performance for the LED embedded between the high speed sites and the low speed sites. We recognize that, that depending upon the, um, the treatment type, different variables may be more or less significant. And so we then looked at each individual treatment type. So this is the results for the PHB. And when we just focus on the PHB data, we did find that light level was significant along with higher hourly volume. However, they may be statistically significant. I question whether or not they have a practical difference. Um, the difference in driver yielding between 96 and 98 percent, I think we can debate. Um, but I feel like once you get in those higher 90s, you're, you're really good. Um, you have a really good driver yielding ratio there. With the rectangular rapid flashing beacon, I, I have done a number of RFB studies. Other researchers have also looked at the RFBs. And these previous studies have found higher driver yielding when there are only two legs, like a mid-block as opposed to three or four leg intersection, when a medium refuge is present. So the medium refuge provide the pedestrian a place to wait in the middle of the roadway if they need to, but it also is associated with higher driver yielding. So that's, you know, a, a bonus, a win-win. Um, these previous studies found that if there's a school within a half mile, that the, there is a higher driver yielding. And that advanced yield lines being present is also associated with higher driver yielding. For this current study that included data at 12 RFB sites, um, for these particular 12 sites, we, we, we didn't find 
much in our statistical analysis other than supporting the use of the advanced yield lines. Um, because I have done some of these previous studies, I, we need a lot more than 12 sites to really see relationships between other geometric or roadway or traffic features. With the LED embedded, we had 13 daytime and six nighttime. Um, we did find a lot of statistical significant variables um, associated with the higher driver yielding. Remember, there's that huge range. And what we found, um, I would I would generalize it as if it's at a site where you would, would expect to see a pedestrian, uh, two lanes versus four lanes, lower speed limit groups, narrow lanes, lower hourly volumes, advanced yield lines, then, then the LED embedded had higher driver yielding. So, so this is kind of my wrap up slide. This is the big question that we were exploring in this study. Is the pedestrian treatment more or less effective at night? And this slide is a box plot where the box represent between the first qu quarter and the third quarter. Um, the, the bar in the middle is the median. And what, what I see when I look at this graph, uh, the first two boxes are for the PHB day and night. They're really tight and they're really high. The best treatment with regards to driver yielding is the pedestrian hybrid beacon. On the far right of this graph are the LED embedded. And again, you can see the, the range of data present with the LED embedded treatment. There's a lot of variability with this treatment because they're being used in a lot of different places. Um, the RFB is, is a, a tighter box and it is not as well as the PHB, but certainly is um, has higher driver yielding uh, within this text dot study as compared to the LEDs. Um, and so with that, I will um, conclude my presentation. If you have questions, you can send me an email or we'll have an opportunity for discussions um, at the end of all of the presentations in this session. Thank you for your time. For your time. Thank you, Kay. Again, very interesting topic. I know me being from Florida, we also rank unfortunately higher in those and this is I'm sure um, very important information. I, I, I'm starting to see some questions come in question pod. That's what I wanted to remind everybody. Please include your questions in the question pod for all the speakers, and then we will be taking those questions at the end. Our next speaker is Corey Edgar. Welcome to the Variable Speed Limit System presentation. My name is Corey Edgar from PBX Engineering. Uh, today's presentation is regarding uh, two different types of variable speed limit systems that we've deployed in the province of British Columbia. Uh, first, uh, coming from a rural highway safety speed review that was conducted in 2014, which led to the installation of uh, variable speed limit systems on uh, Highway 91, the Sea to Sky Highway, a Highway 5 Coquihalla Highway, and the Highway 1 Trans Canada Highway um, through the Revelstoke area. Uh, following the successful installation of those systems, we've worked on uh, some additional systems uh, in the Fraser Valley that went live actually in 2020 on Highway 3 and Highway 1. I'll tell you a little bit more about how those systems differ. So the initial rural, rural highway rural highway set systems we deployed were on, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the Sea to Sky, Coquihalla, and the Trans Canada Highway, um, where these highways pass through more than one climatic zone. Uh, and there's significant changes in elevation as you traverse the highway. Um, and where maximum speed limits, you know, really just are, are, are set uh, with an intention for you to choose an appropriate speed um, depending on the conditions. And drivers aren't always great at, at making that appropriate choice. So 
there's a map indicating where those systems are. And there's a hope to uh, improve safety in adverse weather conditions. The two additional systems we deployed on Highway 1 uh, through the Fraser Valley, these are more uh, urban systems. While there's still a freeway, uh, sorry, still a climactic changes and, and adverse weather, we also see a lot more uh, traffic on these sections. So the the systems and their uh, how they operate is a unique to uh, congested freeway environment. You know, with a four lane cross section as well. Highway three system still a rural system but uh, incorporates some of the latest uh, developments in, in our deployments. So in 2014, 2017, that was a, well, we did a gl global jurisdictional review of systems. Uh, we looked at uh, um, different state DOTs and, uh, and uh, studied how they've uh, performed, uh, their systems have performed and their concept of operations that were developed. Uh, we assessed the ministry's existing systems uh, which uh, when we deployed the Fraser Valley systems, we look back at the rural ones that we completed and, and uh, built upon them uh, to enhance and improve performance. We looked at uh, speed harmonization in the urban areas when we did the Fraser Valley section. So reducing the risk to motorists and providing uh, more predictable travel times were the goals for uh, employing speed harmonization. As I mentioned, our jurisdictional review, that included uh, Washington State, Oregon DOT, Virginia DOT, Highways England, and the existing systems in BC um, when we, when we re revisited this in 2017. So we, we looked at uh, these deployments from, uh, you know, were they regulatory, were they advisory? The, the BC Ministry of Transportation chose to go with a regulatory um, method as, a, as opposed to advisory signage. Um, the each type of system we looked at, you know, was either a tra traffic responsive only or weather and traffic responsive. So these were just some of the some of the factors we looked at here in their lengths. And we looked very detailed, of course, at sign spacing and placement as well. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So our concept of operations that we developed for for BC uh, broke down the system into uh, to include a road weather subsystem, which looks at pavement condition. Uh, as well as visibility. Uh, we developed a traffic subsystem as well, which is looking at uh, uh, the 85th percentile traffic speeds on the roadway, as well as traffic density. So with the road weather system subsystem and the traffic subsystem, you've got some automated uh, response and automated uh, variable speed limits. We also have RTMC, the Regional Transportation Management Center, as it was called. Uh, TMC uh, operators who can provide input as well to the system. Um, and depending on the subsystem, sorry, depending on the, the lowest speed selected, uh, any of the subsystems can, uh, can dictate speed limits on the roadways. The lowest speed is selected. Our concept of operations included a review of uh, the signage itself. So uh, we, we, we wanted to go with a regulatory type sign that uh, we went with a hybrid that's a combination of a static message, which really looks like your, your conventional uh, MUTCD speed limit sign, at least the Canadian version, and uh, a regulatory, sorry, a, uh, an LED display uh, fitting right on top of that. We added a flashing beacon to help um, um, draw attention to the sign when the speed is reduced below the, what would normally be the maximum speed. So in this example, uh, you know, 120 kilometers per hour uh, would be the regular posted speed when conditions are good. And when the speed is reduced to 80, the beacon would be, uh, would be flashing or any speed below 120. Uh, we have a spacing of approximately five kilometers for the between signs for the rural installations and on the the more urban environment in the Fraser Valley, we've got a one kilometer spacing between signs and some supporting signage, uh, including dynamic message signs, which can help advise motorists of conditions ahead and some supporting static signage uh, as you enter and leave the uh, variable speed limit corridor. So for road weather information, we are using infrared uh, sensors on the side of the roadway. 
we we're uh, measuring in both directions of travel. Uh, we were looking at a grip factor, visibility, um, and of course, pavement temperature and pavement condition. And with both directions of travel, you know, the, the rationale there is that you may have a, a snow plow come through, you know, say northbound on a highway and then southbound, uh, it hasn't passed by yet. So you could, you could have really disparate uh, conditions, both northbound or sorry, between northbound and southbound. And in 2017, we introduced additional sensors to, to look at present weather conditions. So uh, rainfall, temperature, humidity, et cetera, uh, wind speed as well. Well, for the traffic data, we're uh, using a radar technology and looking at per vehicle data. So this is uh, not an aggregated, you know, five minute volume. We're looking at actually individual vehicles passing by the sensor. Uh, one of the reasons we're doing that is that we're uh, on some of the highways where we've got uh, mountainous terrain. We're actually looking at truck, truck traffic and removing trucks from some of the uh, algorithms so that they have less influence on uh, on the posted speed on the highway. So if we uh, we're not reducing the travel, uh, sorry, reducing the the posted speed just because there are slow moving trucks. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, the Coquihalla Highway, for example, where there's quite a climb for for trucks coming up the the grade. Then we look at historical volume, speed, occupancy, and as I mentioned, classification to to help do that filtering. On the side of the highway, we, you'd see typically these types of field control cabinets. We're using a programmable logic uh, controller um, type device. It's actually, in this case, you see in the picture is a Cam uh, Campbell Scientific device that um, does the, includes all of the, uh, the algorithm associated with decision making in the field that happens in the field right, right there in the cabinet. So power distribution, uh, cellular modems, a data logger, uh, sign control and uh, backup power supply systems. But on the rural highway, what you'd see uh, typically this type of installation and configuration of the signs across from each other and for both directions of travel, you know, leveraging the same um, cellular communications and power distribution and, and CCTV uh, coverage. So by putting those signs across from each other, kind of share a lot of the same infrastructure. In this example, of course, the sign is covered with bag before deployment. And then from a device kind of grouping and placement perspective, um, if we take a look at, uh, at any given sign on this drawing in, a, in any given direction, you'll see the, the, the arrows that, uh, that lead to that sign. So a blue arrow, for example, um, showing you that for that particular message sign, downstream of that sign, uh, any number of devices can be configured to support that messaging, including the device right at the sign itself. So if there are two or three traffic radars ahead, um, we, can, we can bring that data back to that sign to control the output uh, or to control the, the speed on that particular sign. Um, and same with a, a, a road weather sensor. It could be upstream. It could also be downstream. Maybe just be the nearest sensor um, if there wasn't one uh, reasonably located downstream. Obviously, that wouldn't be as applicable for, for radar traffic data, but it was considered reasonable for the road weather information. And this would be an example of the rural deployment um, advanced traffic management system software interface that an operator would see in the in the um, in the TMC so in, for the rural application where um, the operators actually have to accept speed changes so the way that the Ministry uh, of Transportation and BC deployed their rural systems is that they rely upon the operator to review and accept speed limit changes um, they're not done automatically. The, the, the final decision is made by the operator to accept those. Uh, so this interface had to be designed to be easy for the operators to know what needs their attention. So um, where do they need, what, what action is required um, on, on each corridor and, and, how can, and what, what is it that needs the operator's attention? So um, this would be an, an example where you can see uh, 
which subsystem is driving the speed change. You, know, you have a camera to, to validate that visually, and you also have a, an image in the top right where you see that 100. That's actually an image representing the sign face and the pixels that make up that sign message, um, showing us whether or not um, the sign is displaying correctly the speed. So I mentioned we, uh, we completed a, another jurisdictional review following um, the rural uh, installations. We, we wanted to look at what these other agencies were doing um, on a more urban kind of corridor. We explored um, you know, the sign dimensions, for example. Um, we looked at uh, the sign placement above the lanes um, and what other agencies were doing with spacing. The ministry had been successful already with the three rural installations. Um, and with the Fraser Valley more urban sort of uh, installation, there's an interest in, uh, in revisiting sign dimensions and, and spacing to make sure that we were consistent with what other agencies were doing. So we saw, um, you know, a real variety of sign messaging and placement um, and uh, spacing. We also, we saw that other agencies, as you see in the top right here, are using other types of message signs on the on the same gantries. In this case, it's displaying travel time messaging, but we've also seen these dynamic message signs being used to explain a little bit more about what's up ahead um, with respect to variable speed limits. So for the Fraser Valley, we looked at uh, larger signs um, and more frequent spacing. Uh, we looked at uh, considering um, occupancy when we look at the, and not just speed of vehicles. Um, we looked at uh, speed smoothing and cascading, which I'll show you a little bit here, but um, a little more about in a future si slide, but we are looking at smoothing out that speed to um, make, if we wanted to say, make a reduction to 60 kilometers per hour downstream, we might slowly bring people down to that speed so that you've got a 60, an 80, you know, a 90, a 100 um, to slowly get down to that lower speed. And an update to the user interface, and definitely uh, an uh, autonomous operation. We understand that on a freeway condition, we can't leave it up to operators to uh, review and accept messages. It's really important for us to uh, to have the system work autonomously. You see here a, a deployment in the top right there, a, a dynamic message sign that was added to these uh, speed limit signs. So well, we're, we're finding greater compliance with the speed limits, um, messaging, uh, helping motorists understand why speeds have been reduced so we're no, they don't just get a reduced speed they actually get an explanation for what's ahead we placed uh, a larger sign um, overhead and we also included one on the shoulder now so we've got two signs um, in any direction of traffic travel I should say we found that's been a really successful and here's some additional photos just to give you a sense of what these signs look like uh, when we're uh, doing our factory acceptance testing. Oops. And I'll just show you here with this slide the, the concept of the uh, cascading speeds. So you'll see that there's an incident at six, and we've reduced uh, the speed to 60. Upstream, you'll see that slowly reduced from 110 to 100 to 80 to 60 so that we don't uh, have an immediate abrupt change from 110 kilometers to an hour to, an hour to 60, for example. So there you have it. That's the end of the presentation and thanks for your time. Thank you, Corey. Again, very interesting presentation. There are a lot of questions coming for all the speakers. So please, again, before we get into our final presentation, we will be taking any questions after we have heard from all the presenters. And please include your questions in the question pod. Our final speaker for this session is Michael Fontaine. Michael. All right, hello everyone. I'm Mike Fontaine from the Virginia Transportation Research Council. And today I'm gonna to be talking about a project that we did in Virginia, looking at using variable speed limits to improve safety during fog events. So first, by way of background, um, I-77 is an interstate located in mountainous terrain in rural Southwest Virginia, and it experiences very frequent dense fog events on this corridor. Uh, it's actually the equivalent of about 18 days a year 
that fog is present on this corridor. And because of this fog, we've experienced a lot of issues on this location with uh, significant chain reaction rear end crashes that occur during these limited visibility conditions. So on this slide, you can see a, a few photos from past major multi uh, vehicle collisions that we've had on the corridor. Uh, back in 2013, we actually had a 95 vehicle crash event with three fatalities. There was another 28 vehicle crash event that happened in 2014. Um, when you talk to the officers that respond to these events, these are, are cases caused by drivers traveling too fast for the available visibility on the corridor. And in some cases, the fog is so dense, the officers will comment that they're standing at the back of a tractor trailer and they cannot see the cab and people are still going 70 miles an hour when we look at the, the uh, vehicle speed data in the corridor. So just to help orient you to, to the location that I'm talking about here, uh, we're basically talking about a stretch of I-77 right at the North Carolina line in Virginia. This is a road that's got 18,000 ADT. It's got a very high percentage of trucks, 27% trucks in this corridor. It's very rural. Um, this is definitely a through route, not a lot of local communities here. Um, there's a 65 mile an hour base speed limit. And one geometric factor that's very important here is there's a sustained negative 4% grade for about six miles in the southbound direction. So there's a very long sustained downhill slope on this corridor. And because of all these safety issues that we've seen during fog, VDOT has deployed multiple signing and delineation efforts to try and improve the, the visibility of traffic control devices in the corridor, but yet we still have not been able to, to see significant changes in safety during these fog events. So in 2016, VDOT installed a $7.5 million variable speed limit system. Uh, this variable speed limit system consisted of 13 dynamic message signs, 36 full matrix, matrix variable speed limit signs, which is what you can see in the upper right-hand corner of these photos here, uh, eight variable speed limit cutout signs, which uh, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, uh, 25 closed circuit TV cameras, 22 Wavetronic sensors, and 14 uh, ARWIS stations that included the ability to measure visibility uh, and measure the fog density that we've got here. And that's what's shown here on the bottom uh, photo on this slide. Um, and basically the whole goal of this variable speed limit system was to try and adjust our speed limits so that they represented a safe speed to traverse with the dense fog that we're seeing in this corridor. And so the signs that we deployed were generally spaced about a mile apart over about a 12 mile span going from North Carolina into Virginia. So what I'm gonna talk about today is sort of three aspects of this project. First, we're gonna talk about our attempts to sort of understand driver behavior and safety before we activate the variable speed limit system. And then how we use that information to define our control algorithm for how the VSL was gonna operate. And then once we got everything up and activated, I'm gonna talk about how the system has impacted safety on this corridor. So first let's talk a little bit about the characteristics of fog on this section of road. So uh, what we've got here is a representation of the average number of hours of fog at various densities that we have um, in the five years prior to when we installed the variable speed limit system. So essentially what we did here is we used the visibility sensors that were present in the corridor that gave us an estimated visibility in feet. And so from that visibility and feet, we could use the AASHTO stopping sight distance equation and calculate what's a safe speed to traverse this corridor given the amount of visibility that we have. And so what you can see over here on the right is we've got kind of a color coded uh, matrix that sort of shows different levels of visibility that we had, what the corresponding safe speed is, and then in the figure on the left, it's showing the proportion of time that that visibility condition was present on the corridor. And so if we look at the, the figure on the left, the North Carolina line is on the left side of the screen, and we're moving into Virginia as we move left to right across the bottom on the milepost cord, uh, section. And so there's definitely a, a cluster of areas where we see fog on this corridor between milepost three and nine. Um, when we look at the densest place on the corridor, where we see a lot of fog is at milepost six. This is on the side of a mountain, and about 5% of the year, we're seeing some level of fog there. So 5% so of the year, you know, one out of 20 days, is continuous fog at that corridor at some level, if you think about it that way. So we're getting a lot of fog here, a lot more than what you would expect. Now, when we look at the crash data that we had on this corridor in the before period, even though our worst location only experienced 5% uh, uh, 
uh, fog 5% of the time, 11% of the crashes we see on this stretch of road did happen during fog. So we're definitely seeing an over-representation of crashes happening during these limited visibility events. And 84% of our crashes during fog are happening in the southbound or downhill direction on this corridor. So, so clearly we have an interaction here between speed of traffic, limited visibility, and that downhill grade. Um, now, when we look at the characteristics of these crashes that we have during fog versus during clear conditions, the, the crashes during fog tend to be much more severe. We've got about 48% of our crashes, our fatal and injury crashes during fog versus only 25% um, during clear conditions. And they're also much more likely to involve multiple vehicles. Um, during clear conditions, we have uh, a case where primarily we have single vehicle run off the road, roadway departure kind of crashes predominating, but during fog, we're seeing a lot more multi-vehicle rear end crashes where only 9% of our crashes during fog are single vehicle. The other 91% are involving at least two vehicles. So we're, we're definitely seeing different characteristics during these fog conditions. So we also wanted to look at how are people driving during fog um, before we deployed the system. And so this is some data that we collected using a Wavetronic sensor on the corridor, where on the uh, y-axis, we've got the average speed of traffic in a 15-minute interval, and then we've got the visibility that was present during that 15-minute interval. Uh, the blue dots represent an average speed that happened during the nighttime. The pink dots represent an average speed that happened during the daytime. And what I want you to draw your attention to is the purple line here represents the safe speed based off of the stopping site distance equation. And the two other lines are representing the central tendency of our data during day and night. And so the thing to look at here is people are driving much faster than is really safe given the amount of visibility during the fog. And in some cases, we're seeing people driving over 20 miles an hour faster than what would be safe if we use the AASHTO stopping site distance safe speed. Okay, so all this kind of factored into our decision of how we're going to operate the variable speed limit system and how we're gonna set up our control algorithm. So our before data showed that people were naturally driving much faster than the fog dictated. And so originally going into this project, we were thinking that posting stopping site distance safe speed might be a preferred alternative for us to go to. But the concern here is that if we post a speed limit that is perceived as being too low to the driver, they're not going to comply with that speed limit. And we're going to see issues with speed variance, which could in turn increase negative interactions in those multi-vehicle crashes that we saw. So instead, what we did is we created a step function that basically split the difference between what people were driving now and what we wanted them to drive to hopefully try and encourage that compliance. So the algorithm uh, basically set the speeds based off of the worst visibility location, then the, the variable speed limits along the corridor are smoothed and grouped together in order to transition into and out of the fog. Uh, speed limits could decline by up to 10 miles an hour, they're updated every six minutes, and we had a 30 mile an hour minimum that we could post. Uh, on the education side and, and enforcement side, um, we couldn't do automated speed enforcement in this corridor, so we had to rely on manual enforcement. And obviously, there's a lot of concern about officer safety if you're going to manually enforce these speed limits. So really what happened is that the variable speed limits were archived and they were used to write citations after the fact, but we didn't have officers out there during the fog actively uh, enforcing the variable speed limits. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of the uh, traffic in this area, this is a very rural area, we had a lot of through traffic, so there was, most of the outreach happened through increased signing and advanced warning that we provided on the corridor. You can see some of the uh, warning uh, uh, signs that we posted on the corridor that alert the drivers that they're entering a variable speed limit zone and why the speed limits are going to be varying uh, on the corridor. So we're really focusing on the unfamiliar through drivers uh, when we're doing our, our outreach. Okay, so what, what happened on this corridor once we turned everything on? So I'm going to show an example. This is one location. This is about milepost four. And on the left, we've got our before data. On the right, we've got our after data. Same location. The green line represents our stopping site distance safe speed. It's the exact same line on both sides. And what I want you to focus on is the blue line, which is sort of the central tendency of our data. And so what you're seeing here is clearly the speeds have come down and they've become more in line with what we want people to drive based off of the stopping site distance safe speed. So we have been able to reduce speeds and get increased compliance here. Um, 
one thing I do want to mention here is that when you look at the orange dots, the orange dots on the before data are based off of 15 minutes. The orange dots on the after data are based off of six minutes. So if the, the data in the after period looks a little noisier and looks like there's more variability, it's just a function of the time aggregation, not a function of the fact that uh, there was no increase in variability in the data. It's just because of the time intervals that are being compared in this figure. And so overall, what we tended to see is across the different visibility bins, um, we're seeing a, a reduction in mean speed of between five and six miles an hour. So we were able to successfully bring down the average speeds in this corridor after we deployed the variable speed limit system. But what's, what's particularly compelling here is that even though the speeds only came down five to six miles an hour, we saw very substantial changes in the crashes, especially during fog. So the table here documents our changes in crash frequency, um, just looking at, at raw crash numbers. And so when we look across all conditions, um, we saw that there was about a 10% increase in overall crashes, around an 11% decline in fatal and injury crashes when we compare three years before activation of the VSL to three years after activation. I, and neither one of those changes were statistically significant when we did, um, when we tried to look at the crash modification factors. However, when we looked at the fog crashes, we saw a 70 to 80% reduction in crashes that occurred after we activated the variable speed limit system. And so we were able to look at this using the empirical Bayes method. We found that these crash reductions were in fact statistically significant. And you know, we were able to generate very, very large reductions in crashes as a result of this variable speed limit system going in. Okay, so uh, in terms of effectiveness and lessons learned, a few things that I want to point out. Um, the drivers did not necessarily decelerate significantly until they reached the fog zone. So in our case, we were uh, slowly stepping down the speeds at, in order to transition from the normal posted speed limit into the reduced speed in the fog. And the drivers didn't necessarily decelerate with those reduced speeds until they actually saw the fog itself. And so this created a, a zone of non-compliance in the reduction zone approaching that critical section. So the lesson learned here is that if you have predefined locations where you have known speed drops, you might want to have denser sign spacings to be able to create those speed limit transitions in a shorter spatial area. Um, also, we saw that while the speeds declined by five to six miles an hour, we saw very pronounced changes in safety. This is hopefully going to uh, create a, a situation where speed is not necessarily the best surrogate for the overall effectiveness of the system. You might see actual safety effects larger than speed reductions. So the system appears to have been successful in creating awareness, even if it wasn't necessarily manifested in the speed changes. And right now, one of the things that VDOT's looking at is expanding usage of the VSL in order to look at reduced speeds for snow and ice, high winds, or work zones on the corridor. So with that, um, if anyone has any questions about this presentation, um, here's my contact information if you'd like to get in contact. If you want to hear more detail about the system, there's also a link to a report that has a lot more information about this project uh, for anybody who's interested. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, all of our speakers. At this time, I would like to request all of our speakers to turn their cameras on. We will now begin the Q&A and discussion portion of the session. Again, if you have any questions for any of our speakers, please be sure to post in the question part. Based on what we have already received, I'm going to pick some questions. A um, couple questions for Ms. K, uh, and they are more for site selection related. Are PHB pedestrian hybrid beacon locations all mid block crossings and the other one kind of related was were the led em sites um, pedestrian activated or do they flash 24 7. so all of our sites were pedestrian activated um, none of them are 24 7 and i would encourage anyone who still has uh, beacons that flash 24 7 to replace them because they are not very effective um, it's the pedestrian activation. It's it's that change that helps alert the driver that there's a pedestrian who wants to cross the street. With respect to the number of legs at each of our crossing, we had a mix. Um, for the PHBs, five out of the ten had 
two legs or at a mid block crossing and the other five were at um, three leg or four legged intersections. Okay, thank you. A uh, couple questions on variable speed limit ones, and because Corey's presentation was on that and Michael's was on that on that as well, so I'm going to toss some questions um, either way. Um, one was, have the variable speed limit systems been effective in reducing speeds, and does it reduce crashes? And I know Michael's presentation did talk about speeds. Um, this question was directed more towards Corey, so. From your perspective, any relation, Corey, about changing speeds and specifically change in crashes? <clears throat> and I, I, I wasn't, I didn't participate in in those particular studies. I know that the Ministry of Transportation in BC has conducted those for the rural systems, the original three, and uh, there was a reduction in crashes and um, and there was a measure of effectiveness of the speeds. And I'm sorry, I don't have that information to provide in in my presentation or during this question and answer period. So. But the, I know the research has been done by the Ministry of Transportation specifically. No problem. Um, and I had another question for Brian, and I know Brian, you are very active nationally. I've seen some of your blogs about uh, colorblind individuals and uh, how it is very important to accommodate for all road users. And that is a significant amount of population that doesn't get included. Um, at least not in our traditional way. Uh, my question is horizontal heads versus vertical heads. I saw in some of your pictures, you had some horizontal heads. And then uh, my experience, I have been told by one of our uh, colorblind individuals that I know of here, is they look at the location of the lens and the light, and therefore vertical is more preferred than horizontal. So any when you when you talk about some low cost solutions, visibility. Uh, what, what are your thoughts? Have you seen anything that backs this up? Yeah, the, the thing about, so yes, and thanks for bringing that up. So there's definitely a significant portion, roughly four to 5% of the population, at least in the United States, that has some kind of color vision deficiency identified. Um, and so one of those issues where it often comes up is that signals. And so the horizontal versus vertical heads could be one of those, even though you're right, I kind of caught, you caught me or I caught myself too um, when I presented on that. One of my slides does have a, a horizontal head. Um, I very much prefer vertical heads and I, you know, I've written about this before. Um, I know there's some states, particularly in the South, that do have a lot of horizontal heads for various reasons, wind load and otherwise. Um, that's a pretty big policy issue most of the time. And, Oftentimes an agency isn't gonna go in and just decide to switch from horizontal to vertical. Um, but it's something that I think can be important. The other important piece of that is if you have horizontal heads, being sure that you're following the manual and that your red is always on the left. And that is technically supposed to always be true. It's a shall condition in the manual, but it's not always true in real life. Um, and so that's a pretty important piece to where it's easy to know, oh, red's always gonna be on top, right? We, we don't see that messed up very often. Um, but having red on the right instead of the left can be an issue. Um, my other little soapbox on signal heads right now is having the two different colors in the same indication. So this is actually being used, and I'm thinking used more and more often, going from a four-section flashing yellow arrow configuration to a three-section flashing yellow arrow and putting both the green and the flashing yellow. Am I saying that right? It's, it's having green and yellow in the same head, and it's, it's done several different ways, um, but that's particularly problematic for me because I'm not able to see that change physically going up the head from green to yellow. And that's, I think it's a pretty big problem. It's allowed in the MECCD. Um, I made my opinion known in the, this last round of comments, um, but I'm seeing it happen more and more often. For, and you can imagine why, you know, it's a cost savings. It's, there's a value of, of trying to do that. And so it, I can see how it would make sense but there is a subset of drivers who will be confused and would potentially make a bad decision um, based on that. So that's one of Thank the things you, I would have us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for Michael, uh, this is more of a question comment. Rather than speed reduction, could crash reduction by the variable speed limit system be best attributed to reducing the perception reaction time? So I, I think that's certainly a possible reason for the crash reduction that we observed you know certainly we're alerting drivers that something's coming up and so hopefully they're more prepared to address 
you know, a, an unexpected event there, you know, the, and that would dovetail with the fact that we're seeing sort of that disproportionate change between speeds and crashes, where the speeds only went down five or six miles an hour, but our crashes went down 75%. So, you know, even though people were still overdriving based off the amount of available visibility, it's possible that we don't need that two and a half second, you know, perception reaction time that we assume in the uh, stopping side distance equation, because people are alerted to the condition that's happening, and, and that may be a potential influence that we've got there. Thank you. And this next question could be for Corey or Michael or both. For variable speed control, do you ever use one speed for uphill traffic and a different speed for downhill traffic? Yeah, in our corridor on I-77, um, we're controlling each direction of travel differently because we have this six mile long 4% grade. So our downhill is set based off of the speeds that we're seeing in that direction and then uphill is set accounting for that four percent uphill grade um, and, and I one thing I didn't mention in my presentation that Corey mentioned that I think was good is uh, in our uphill direction we actually have a truck climbing lane which we're not using in any of our speed estimation in that corridor we're only focusing on the uh, the two lanes that are using the the past that are not influenced by those slow moving uphill trucks so so we're definitely setting by direction but we're not setting by lane we're setting by direction, but not lane by lane. And that applied even to the I-66 project that I think Corey uh, talked about briefly uh, in Virginia uh, as one of our other variable speed limit systems. And if I could just cool. add to that, um, yeah. that we also will find like differing conditions uh, for road weather as well. So um, if, a, if a snow plow has come through and cleared, you know, one, one direction and not the other, for example, so it doesn't even have to be on a steep grade. And, and as you said, Michael, we're we're actually filtering out trucks, regardless of which lanes the trucks are in, we're looking at the classification and pulling them out of the equation. Thanks, Tim. Okay. Thank you. And uh, this is specifically for you, Corey. How reliable is the cel cellular communications along rural corridors for the variable speed limit signs? I mean, that's, yeah, we're covering a lot of different areas here. So there's, it's, it's variable <laughs> and, and uh, reliability. I don't think we have great measurements. If I, I'm sure we could uh, look at that from an IT perspective and look at uh, uh, how often, you know, those connections cut out, but um, you know, we have, we've got sort of fail safe, so to speak, and in, in the system to, uh, to respond to those different conditions. So yeah, there, it's not ideal. So on, on the urban corridors, that's why we've gone with uh, fiber optic communications. But it's just a reality of any kind of rural installation, there's gonna be some challenges with the communication, but we're only installing where we've got, you know, that option to install. <laughs> okay. Um, this is uh, 4K. Was street lighting considered in the day versus night pedestrian treatments? So street lighting was considered. We um, noted if the street light was present and, and for all of our intersections, all of our crossings, there was some type of street lighting present either at the crossing or near the crossing. Um, however, there was some comments made by some of my data collectors that they felt the street lighting wasn't at the level that they would have preferred so I think we do need to pay attention to street lighting. Within this particular TxDOT study, we don't have enough sites to be able to draw any observations or conclusions about the type of street lighting or the location of the street lighting. Um, based upon some of the numbers I'm seeing, it's gonna need a much larger study, a lot more study sites to be able to start drawing those types of conclusions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Brian, next one's for you. Um, have you considered reflective backplates for signals? And I know uh, as a low cost countermeasure, if not, why not? And what is your experience with them? Yeah, absolutely. I'm a huge fan of reflective backplates and just didn't happen to mention that in the, the short presentation today. That's a federal highway proven safety countermeasure. There's pretty good research now over the last decade of seeing up to like a 15% reduction in all crashes at signalized intersections with that very low cost treatment. So I'm a big fan of that one. And that actually helps a lot with colorblind users as well. For me personally, the green indication of the signal and the nearby white street lights have a very similar color. The green lights look more white to me than green and for some other users as well. So having that outline, especially at night of the signal head with the reflective backplate just gives uh, just additional information to people who may not be able to use the color 
as well as most drivers. Thank you. Corey, next one's for you. Um, how is variable speed enforced? If signs are spaced five kilometers apart, is there potential for the current speed to be different from what the motorist last saw? Absolutely, yeah, the speed can change immediately after you move underneath the sign. Uh, but you know enforcement is 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 not focusing on those you know those those immediate changes, right? So there's some time that needs to pass travel time basically between um, to uh, to really consider enforcement. And enforcement is not the, you know similar to what Michael had said there. Uh, enforcement is not something that's happening on the road at the at the time and these when these conditions are poor in fact i don't believe there's any you know scrubbing of data as as, as michael had suggested is happening uh, in virginia to to send citations later um, i think it's really if there if there is there is some enforcement that happens and if and they can always go back and look at you know the records for that uh, speed change and they're not going to be uh, ticketing somebody you know 10 seconds after the speed has changed so yeah. It's not, it's not it, an issue. And maybe to be clear about what we're doing in Virginia, basically, we're not actively enforcing during the fog events, but in the event that there is a collision and the officer is able to ascertain what that speed was at collision, then he can go back to the archive and look at where they're driving too fast for conditions or exceeding the posted speed limit. So Thanks, it's good. Yeah, we, yeah we, we don't have automated speed enforcement in our toolbox yet. Um, and for, I, for I didn't hear speed that either, yeah. but, um, but I, I think this happened similar in BC. You know, that, that data is available and if it needs to be used in court, there's uh, appropriate ways to support those speed limit changes and <laughs> yeah and, and I, I guess I'd add to maybe while we're talking about variable speed limits and enforcement I, I think Corey mentioned some of the urban speed harmonization efforts um, like our I-66 corridor where it was very much a congestion based speed harmonization effort Enforcement there was a challenge too because the officers don't want to go out and enforce in the middle of afternoon rush hour and then blue lights on the side of the road immediately, you've created even worse congestion than what you would have had beforehand. So enforcement without the automated enforcement, things that, that are in the toolbox like they have in Europe, you know, becomes a little bit more of a challenge. And that was part of our reason on I-66, we went with advisory speeds rather than regulatory speeds um, for those congestion-based uh, VSL approaches. Uh, Michael, while you're on, uh, the next one is, have there been any pileups since the VSL system was introduced or have those been eliminated entirely? Yeah, no, we have, we have not had any significant multi-car collisions uh, since the VSL was activated. So so it's been, uh, you know, the, the most important, you know, performance measure sometimes is the the number of times the media contacts you. So uh, we, we've significantly uh, improved overall safety. The, the collisions that have happened in fog, like I said, you know, we're seeing an 80% reduction. And those are mainly, you know, two vehicle collisions, single vehicle run off the road crashes. And so those high, you know, uh, number of multi-vehicle crashes, 10, 20, 30 crashes that we have not seen any in the last three years. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Uh, okay, next one's for you. Uh, do you have an example of the advanced, advanced yield lines? Um, so I was given this question early. I don't see a way I can share my screen. So um, I would just encourage you to Google advanced yield lines. Um, they're figure 3B-15 in the MUTCD. Um, some people call them shark teeth. We use them to kind of pull back where drivers are stopping um, in situations where there's a condition known as multiple threat. And that's when you have two cars. Well, it's, it's, it's to stop the car from passing a stopped car and in, in hitting the pedestrian. By pulling them further away from the crossing, the, it gives the drivers uh, more time to be able to recognize that there's a pedestrian in the crosswalk. And it also gives the pedestrian additional uh, time to see if there's a car coming around the stop car. Okay. Yeah, I think that is a very standard. We use it quite a bit at roundabout entrances as well for yield yeah. sharking. And, no. and they're also known as advanced stop lines. It depends on if your state's a yield to pedestrian or a stop to pedestrian um, type of law. Okay. 
Uh, Brian, this is a follow-up to what we talked about back plates, and I think I, I had this in my mind as well. What is the preferred color for black plates? And to my head, also signal housing, because uh, the, the, the question uh, is, I have seen both yellow and black. I think black makes signal indications pop more. Yeah, so in terms of the signal housing, I like black. I don't have any like research behind that. I, at first, I would say having a back plate in the first place, whether it's reflective or not, um, it can make a lot a big difference. Again, not to harp on the colorblind thing, but for everybody, like you said, it just makes the signals pop more if they have that black backing. Um, in terms of the retroreflective sheeting around the outside and the color of that, I, I would just yield to whatever the standard is. I kind of forget. I've seen white and yellow both used over the years. Um, I feel like yellow might be the standard now, but I'd actually refer you back to the Federal Highway documentation on that. It's They have some pretty good stuff on that. And, you know, if Jeff Shaw is on or around sometime this week, which I'm sure he is, he'd be the, the resident expert on that um, nationally, I think, related to that, the detail of that treatment. And to build on this backplates and reflective ones, I know it is it is preferred specifically state of Florida where the red light running cameras are good one day and not good the other day. Uh, what ends up happening is you, it is good to have these kinds of countermeasures so that it's not about catching the people in the act, but it is also about giving the drivers an opportunity to be able to see the actual indication so that they can react appropriately. And I think that is one of the things that I think state legislature, when we have to report annually, what have you done here? Then they would like to look for that. Have you done something to improve the visibility of signal heads or this location is just a chronic red light running location. So um, for my jurisdiction, I know we have uh, all black plates with two inch uh, yellow reflective water. It's standard on every signal head. Yeah, and real quick on, so I'm a fan of automated red light enforcement. I think it, it works. We have really good data that shows that it works in reducing red light running and then also reducing angle crashes at signalized intersections, especially those that have an indicated problem. I've also become increasingly convinced over the last few years that a lot more people than I thought right, run red lights on accident. I think we've learned this by doing more video analytics analysis of signalized intersections and um, it's not always that they're pushing the yellow into the red and then they're running it two or three seconds after. Sometimes it's mid phase and it's just weirdly random. And I think some of those are on us. Like we need to make our signals more conspicuous to be sure that people um, can see them as well as possible. And of course it's on them and all of us as we're driving to be paying attention and not be distracted. But I think there's a, there's more happening there than just catching the bad people who are running red lights. Um, I think red light running is more complex than that. I agree. And and to the visibility issue, and I think you men mentioned the maintenance as well. Um, I come across, we all love residential tree-lined streets, uh, but when those beautiful canopies uh, do block the signal heads, and it happens quite often, it is necessary to trim those so that we can actually see those signal heads well in time. And specifically at locations where it is prone to some queuing during the peak hours, you want the it's stopping side distances, not just uh, enough. You will need a little more visibility there. Yeah, well, I really want to harp on maintenance for about 90 seconds. It is huge, right? We're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on all these safety treatments. And some percentage of those safety treatments are covered up every single day, especially in the spring and summer. And I think it's really important that. It's so hard because you don't cut ribbons for it. We don't give very many presentations about it because it's not fun and sexy and exciting to talk about maintenance and operations. But man, all the stuff that we put out there has to work and has to be maintained and you need to replace your signs. And even though the feds won't pay for it right now, and that's an issue that we can talk about at a policy level, you still have to keep up with the stuff that you spent safety funds for 10 or 15 or 20 or 40 years ago. And it's really, really important. And guess what? We're not getting more maintenance people to do it. And so we've got to get better and smarter about how we operate and maintain our system. And I think all the TISMO related stuff and things that we're doing in those areas are really important. But just being sure that we care for and take care of and really understand how hard a job um, just daily maintenance and operation is, and that those people don't get to go to the Capitol to shake hands with the governor. And I think that's unfortunate and something that we need to be thinking about more and thinking about ways that we can just do a better job maintaining the things that we have. 
Absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't agree more with being a local agency. Um, Kate, the next one is um, how does, and I, I think this is, I'm going to take this a one step further. It's a, the question is how does the cost of PHB compared to RRFB? And I think maybe the underlying question is the return on investment. Well, um, because uh, you provided me the questions in advance, I did, I was able to Google the numbers and based upon what I found, the range for a PHB is between 20 and 120,000 with an average of about 60,000 as compared to the RRFB, which can be between 10 and 15,000. So the RRFB is uh, lower cost. Um, and, and that starts to get into some of the trade-offs to try to reach that uh, benefit cost comparison that you are alluding to. Um, we have crash modification factors for the PHB. We have the start of crash modification factors for the RFB, but they um, struggled because of sample size. So hopefully we'll have another RFB safety study soon so that we can get some more robust crash modification factors for that treatment and we can look at some trade-offs. If you use driver yielding as, as a surrogate, we, we saw in my presentation that there are some places where the driver yielding at an RFB is very high, um, as high as a PHB, but then we have a lot of other locations where the driver yielding um, in earlier studies was as low as 15%. So there are definitely places where the RFB is not very effective. And, and I tend to agree. And some of these are geographically uh, influenced as well, where you do it, depending on where the drivers are. I'm talking about if you're in Miami versus Tampa versus Orlando, even in the state of Florida, uh, where you have visitors coming from different states and uh, or different countries, and they come here. So th there are a lot of factors that go in Sometimes what we call it is we want a red component so that people universally know red is equal to stop. Uh, yeah. And it also depends on the law that is in your state. Is it yield to pedestrians in crosswalk or stop for pedestrians in crosswalk? So there are a lot of factors that go in it. And my opinion is something is better than nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. So if the money is an issue, then RRFB is a good start rather than uh, plain static signs. Um, more compliance, even if it is in the 20s or 30s range, is better than five and seven. Every life save is, is important. Um, there are some places, though, that I would caution about using the RFB. We found that the wider crossings, the six lanes, is not very good with the RFB. Another location is when you have a trail um, intersecting, say, an arterial street. Uh, drivers aren't expecting pedestrians in this kind of suburban, ex-urban setting where there's a lot of greenery because, because there's the trail through the green space. And, and because of this unexpected pedestrian appearance, uh, the driver yielding, in fact, the 15% number I quoted was at a trail crossing. So in those cases, I'm not saying don't don't treat it. I'm saying treat it even more. Um, we know that those trail crossings can be challenging, and so additional treatments may be needed to appropriately communicate to the driver that there is a pedestrian or a bicyclist needing to cross the street. Yep, absolutely. Uh, to stay on time, I look at the clock. It's 12:28. Excellent discussion. Uh, I want to thank all of our speakers and thank you all for attending today. I would like to ask if there are more questions, which I see a couple more questions. If any speakers are going to be in the Wonder Room, uh, then they uh, then please let us know. To access Wonder, go to the conference platform, uh, uh, like where you selected this session, and select Hallway Talk. Then go to the Technical Sessions area. Are there any uh, speakers who would be willing to be in that Hallway Talk? Because there are a few more questions that we could not cover. Yeah. All right. Um, as a reminder, to receive PDH credits, you must first view the entire webinar live or recorded. Hopefully, 200 of us were here. Uh, so we have uh, you could stick with us, uh, complete the evaluation associated 
and then your credit certificate will be unlocked and available under the certificates tab located in your ITE Learning Hub account. The evaluation link for this technical session is also posted in the questions pod for attendees to access. Also, the recording of this session will be available in ITE Learning Hub within 48 hours for all meeting registrants. With that, I really would like to thank every speaker here. What a uh, wonderful conversation that we had afterwards as well. So thank you for your time. Thank you, attendees, and hope you have a wonderful rest of the conference. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.